Uh, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Idel O'Toole. I'm an academic dermatologist in London, and I'm a member of the ESDR board. Uh, and I'm very happy to welcome you to the ESDR Kitchen uh, live uh, webinar. Um, these are a series of uh, webinars which we have developed to um, bring the latest science to ESDR members and others in the skin science community um, since the pandemic began. So today we've got Freshly Baked. Uh, we've got two uh, high impact uh, papers presented by Ruth Cho uh, from the USA and uh, Daisuke Namba uh, from uh, Japan. And this ESDR Kitchen episode is kindly sponsored by Pfizer. Um, please put your questions and answers, uh, sorry, not the answers, just the questions in the Q&A and chat, and we will discuss these after the two 10-minute talks. So I'm happy to hand over to Cardin Conrad, who will introduce the first paper. Thanks, Adele. <clears throat> I mean, you can also uh, chat or put the, quest the answers into the chat if you know them, but uh, I assume uh, the speakers will, will be more capable of doing so. So Kerning Conrad, I'm from Lausanne, Switzerland. I keep it short. I'm, I'm have the pleasure and the honor to introduce the first speaker, which is Ruth Cho, with an A is silent. Um, she did a, um, bachelor, a, a Master of Science in Harvard Med School in Bioengineering, then did a PhD in Immunology in uh, University of Pennsylvania, and is currently doing or adding a, an MD, so Med School, uh, which will finish next year. She passed all this with the uh, greatest honors. And besides that, she also published her first author paper now in science, which we will present uh, today. Besides that, she also found the time to be very active in politics and uh, being a great musician. <clears throat> Among others, she was the co-chair of the Association of Women in Science and Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. So uh, certainly a, a rising star uh, <clears throat> that we have today. So it's a pleasure to have you here. You're working currently in the Kambayashi lab in Pennsylvania and you will present, uh, as mentioned, your uh, publication on the science of this year. So Ruth, thanks for coming. The stage is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, let me pull up my slides. All right. Um, so thank you guys for being here today. Um, I'm going to be telling you about my project thymetromal lymphopoietin or TSLP and how it can cause fat loss through the skin. So as I'm sure you all know, the obesity epidemic is an ever growing problem globally um, with about half of the world's population being either obese or overweight and obesity being a leading cause of premature deaths each year. Um, obesity also causes many medical complications like diabetes and fatty liver disease. And for a long time, people really thought of obesity as this metabolic disorder, but within the past few decades, it's become realized that the immune system actually plays an important role in both the pathogenesis and the regulation of obesity. Um, and it turns out that there are two groups of immune cells that are thought to be beneficial in preventing obesity and its complications. So this includes type two immune cells, such as eosinophils and group two innate lymphoid cells or ILC2s and T regulatory cells or T regs. So our lab has a setting a cytokine called thymectromal lymphopoietin or TSLP. It's an epithelial cell cytokine that is um, present at barrier sites such as the skin, the lung, and the gut. Its expression is triggered by stimuli such as allergens, viruses, and bacteria. And it signals through a heterodimer of the TSLP receptor and IL-7 receptor alpha chain to activate JAK-STAT signaling. So what TSLP is most well known for is its role in activating type two immune cells. But our lab, along with others, have also found that it's important in expanding Tregs systemically. So given these beneficial effects of TSLP in activating type 2 immune cells and expanding Tregs, we wondered whether it might have any therapeutic benefit in obesity. And we hypothesized that it would. So to test this, the first thing that we did is we took wild type mice, we placed them on high fat diet for 10 weeks to make them obese, and then we kept them on a high fat diet while we treat them with either a control or TSLP expressing adena associated virus or AAV. So this AAV allows for a one time simple injection um, to provide for overexpression of TSLP and high TSLP systemic levels. 
What we found is that upon TSLP treatment, these mice um, immediately lost weight. And they also had decreased visceral fat mass and were more insulin sensitive. So here I'm showing the homeostatic model assessment of insulin resistance or HOMO-IR. And you can see that high fat diet mice um, given TSLP had lower HOMO-IR values similar to that of mice on normal chow. We also found that liver triglycerides were also decreased. To see if these um, results were more generalizable to mice on normal chow, we took wild type mice that were on normal chow and treated them with either control or TSLP expressing AAV for two weeks. When we look at the tissue masses of different organs, we found that there was significantly decreased white adipose tissue. So you can see here the epididymal white adipose tissue and the inguinal white adipose tissue were significantly reduced in TSLP treated mice. However, other tissues such as the brown adipose tissue, the bat or the muscle were not affected by TSLP. And this is really important because it suggests that TSLP doesn't cause global cachexia, but rather causes specific loss of white adipose tissue. So our next question was, what's the cellular mechanism? In other words, what are the cell types that are driving this adipose loss? Based on bone marrow chimera studies, we found that TSLP receptor signaling is important in the hematopoietic compartment. So naturally, we want to know what are the hematopoietic cells that are important. We used various genetic models of mice lacking different immune cell subsets. And one of the mouse strains that we tried were E-beta knockout mice. So these are mice that lack alpha beta T cells. And you can see that these mice were completely resistant to TSLP. They didn't lose any adipose upon TSLP treatment, suggesting that alpha beta T cells are important for mediating adipose loss. To understand which T cells are important, we use antibodies to deplete CD4 T cells, deplete CD8 T cells, or deplete both CD4 and CD8 T cells. And you can see here that only when we depleted both CD4 and CD8 T cells did we make mice resistant to TSLP, suggesting that either subset, either CD4 or CD8 T cells can mediate adipose loss. And then finally, to understand if it's TSLP receptor signaling directly on T cells, that's important. We generated TSLP receptor flocks mice and crossed them to CD4 Cree mice to delete the TSLP receptor on T cells. And you can see that these CD4 Cree TSLP receptor flocks mice are completely resistant to TSLP, suggesting that TSLP acts directly on T cells to cause adipose loss. I won't show the data, but um, most of the other immune cell types that we looked at um, didn't seem to be really contributing to this adipose loss phenotype, including our original hypothesized um, cell types, um, type 2 immune cells and Tregs. So next we want to know how is this adipose loss occurring? In other words, what's the metabolic mechanism? So we know that TSLP had to be causing a negative energy balance such that the energy in was less than the energy out. So this means that either TSLP is decreasing energy in or increasing energy out. Things that fall within the energy in bucket include food consumption and nutrient absorption. And things that fall within the energy out bucket include thermogenesis or basal metabolic rate, locomotor activity, or excretion of nutrients into either the feces or the urine. And so we looked at all of these potential hypotheses, um, but it turns out that none of them seem to explain how TSLP was causing adipose loss. However, one thing that we'd always noticed about our mice is that they developed this greasy fur appearance a couple weeks after TSLP treatment. And so given all of our negative metabolic data, we wondered whether that might be explaining how these mice were losing their adipose tissue. Um, so what we did is we shaved the fur off of these mice and um, isolated the lipids off of the fur and found that indeed there was increased lipid mass in mice um, in fur from mice off of TSLP treated mice. We then used thin layer chromatography to look at the different components of these lipids um, to try to understand what is the identity of this lipid. It turns out that skin lipids can come from two sources, either from sebum or, for or from keratinocytes. And um, the way to kind of distinguish between these two sources is to look at wax esters, which are thought to be sebum specific. And indeed, we saw an increase in all of the lipid classes, but we also saw an increase in wax esters, which to us suggested that TSLP is increasing sebum. So the golden question becomes, what happens if you block sebum secretion? We use these mice called ACBM mice that lack an enzyme called seroyl coa desaturase 1 or SCD1. These mice have hypomorphic sebaceous glands. And what you can see as these mice are somewhat resistant to TSLP, they don't lose, ad they don't lose adipose upon TSLP treatment. Um, suggesting that sebum secretion is important for TSLP-driven adipose loss. So our final question was, what is TSLP doing at steady state? What's the role of physiological TSLP? In all of our previous experiments, 
we've been using TSLP AV, which causes really high superphysiological levels of TSLP. Well, we know that TSLP is an important barrier cytokine, and we hypothesize that one of the ways in which it might regulate the skin barrier is by regulating sebum, because sebum actually has many um, antimicrobial properties, and it's also important for the mechanical barrier of the skin. So to examine this question, we looked at wild-type versus unmanipulated TSLP receptor knockout mice. And you can see that at baseline, TSLP receptor knockout mice actually have decreased wax esters in their fur compared to wild-type mice, suggesting that homeostatic levels of TSLP actually regulate homeostatic sebum secretion. There are also many antimicrobial peptides that are secreted as part of sebum. And so we looked at the expression of those sebum-associated antimicrobial peptides and found that they were significantly um, reduced um, in TSLP receptor knockout mice suggesting that TSLP regulates both sebum production and expression of sebum-associated antimicrobial peptides. So to summarize things in a model, what we found is that TSLP is expressed in barocytes, such as the skin epithelium. It can activate TSLP receptor signaling on CD4 or CD8 T cells. This can lead to sebaceous gland holocrine secretion. And at very high superphysiological levels of TSLP, this causes adipose loss because the body undergoes lipolysis to try to replenish those lipids that are being lost through the skin. At more homeostatic physiological levels of TSLP, this is important in regulating the skin barrier function and regulating antimicrobial effects of the skin. So with that, I'd like to thank other members of the lab that helped contribute to this project, our collaborators and our funding. And thank you to all of you for listening. Uh, thank you, Ruth, uh, for an excellent um, summary of your paper. Um, we'll move on to the next paper, which is presented uh, by um, Daisuke uh, Namba, who is um, an associate uh, professor in uh, Tokyo. Um, he received his PhD in biology from Osaka uh, University. He then worked on human keratinocyte stem cells in Lausanne as a postdoctoral fellow with uh, Jan Barangen. Um, he moved back to Japan to join Emi uh, Nishimura's uh, group in Tokyo as an associate professor. Uh, he's going to talk about his recent paper in the Journal of Cell Biology uh, on type 17 collagen. Thank you. You could share your presentation. Okay. Okay, just a moment. So thank you very much for your introduction and inviting me to the EDSDL kitchen. So today I'm very happy to introduce you to our recent study. So skin regenerative capacity declined with age and age related to related wound healing causes uh, chronic wounds by the complication of other disease, uh, diseases like um, diabetes. As you can imagine, uh, chronic wound uh, de decreases the uh, quality of the life of the patient. Furthermore, the complication of chronic wounds sometimes result in amputation. Now the population of aged, peop uh, aged people and diabetic patients are increasing all over the world. So the chronic wounds are the global health concern. To treat and prevent chronic wounds, we need to understand the mechanism of age associated to decline of the skin regenerative capacity, but it's still largely unknown. As shown here, wound healing is a very complex biological process and involved a variety of cell types. So the study using healthy volunteers shows age delayed the epithelialization, but not uh, granular tissue formation is not affected. So the epithelialization is an essential process for completion of wound closure and required epidermal calcinocyte stem cells. However, the behavior of calcinocyte stem cells during the epithelialization remains unknown. So, re can be 
observed as a migration of calcium site from human skin fragments in vivo, uh, in vitro. So you can see the cell division and the cell migration. In addition, the increase in the area of keratin site population by the combination of cell migration and cell division can be also observed in the expansion of human keratin site stem cell colonies in culture. Therefore, we analyze the stem cell behavior during the human keratin site colony formation as an exper experimental model system for the understanding of the epicellization. So first, uh, we performed the time-lapse imaging of human culture site colony formation and found that cell locomotion speed is associated with the expansion of calcium site colony. So even in the early stage of colony formation, keratin site forming uh, large expanding colonies show higher locomotion speed. Conversely, keratin uh, site forming small colonies with stacking phenotype shows slower locomotion. This image analysis suggests that difference in cell locomotion ability are involved in the generation of expanding and stacking colony phenotype. So to test this idea, we next performed a simulation experiment to investigate whether expanding and starting colonies can be generated if only cell locomotive ability is modified. So since we cannot moderate cell motility without affecting cell proliferative ability in cell culture experiments. So we modeled uh, keratin site colony formation based on our observation and the performance of simulation experiment like this. So we gave uh, this rotational motion as an origin of keratin site motility because we previously uh, demonstrated that this motion can generate a corrective motion of human keratin site. So as shown here, if cells has no rotational ability, colonies are just expand with their mitotic pressure and some cells are stacked on the colony. This phenotype is the same as the stacking colony phenotype. On the other hand, if we gave cells the rotational ability like this, the colonies are markedly expand without less stratification and shows an expanding colony phenotype. So this simulation experiment indicates that colony expansion requires uh, cell motility. So timeless imaging and the simulation experiments indicate that keratin site motility is a determinant of colony expansion. So as cell signaling mediated by the receptor tyrosine kinase is essential for the keratin site migration and reepsalization. So we hypothesize that changes in the receptor tyrosine kinase signals are related to the age associated to diet, uh, delayed epsilonization and impaired wound healing. So we next examined which receptor tyrosine kinase signal is changed with aging using mouse model, mouse wound healing model. And receptor tyrosine kinase array identified that EGFR signaling is decreased in the aged mice. And the result was confirmed by the Western protein. So next we examined the effect of EGFR activation by using human culture site stem cell cultures again. So EGF treatment enhance the speed of cell rotational motion and cell locomotion in the colony. EGF also increase the ratio of expanding colony in culture and maintain the stem cells during cell cultivation. So we have previously reported that the hemidesmosomal components 
are involved in the keratin site migration and stem cell maintenance. Therefore, we next investigated whether the EGFR activation modulates the expression of hemidesomal components and they found that EGF treatment increases that type 17 collagen called 17 a expression as shown here. As EGF did not increase the collagen 70A1 messenger RNA, shown here, we forecast the degradation of the collagen 70A1. As shown here, uh, collagen 70A1 can be cleaved by cellular proteases. So we examined the expression of the, these proteases and its inhibitors, and found that TIMP1 expression is induced by the EGF treatment. And recombinant TIMP1 could stabilize uh, collagen 70A1 protein without EGF owl activation. And conversely, at the TIMP1 double regulation by SIRNA decreased uh, collagen 17 r protein. So these results clearly indicate that EGF owl activation inhibit uh, collagen 70A1 proteolysis by inducing TIMP1. So collagen 70A1 knockdown by the SIRNA decreases the speed of the dislocation motion and also uh, cellular locomotion in the colony. The generation of the expanding colonies, uh, the colony forming ability of keratinocytes were also decreased by the collagen 70A1 SIRNA. Even cells were maintained with EGF. So we also examined the expression uh, effect of a collagen 70A1 knockdown on the collective cell migration using Hackett keratin site. So as Hackett cells do not show the differentiation per phenotype in normal culture conditions, so we can analyze basic cell behavior without considering cell differentiation. So Hackett keratin site close the gap by the collective migration. So collagen 70A1 is a identity delayed gap. Next, we treated cells with mitomycin C to prevent cell preparation. Even in the mitomycin C treatment, uh, Hackett cells close the gap by the only cell migration. However, collagen 71 knockdown significantly inhibits the gap closure in the mitomycin C treated Hackett cells. So these results clearly indicate that collagen 71 mediated cell motility is required for the reabsorption. So cytoskeleton is involved in the cell migration. So we finally investigated that the distribution of cytoskeletons at the periphery of the migrating hacker cells. As shown here, uh, action microfilaments were localized at the periphery of cells and keratin intermediate filaments were placed inside the peripheral action network and collagen 78 expression was localized at the boundary of action and keratin filament network. When uh, collagen 70A1 not expression uh, decreased by the SHRNA, the area of uh, peripheral action network here were decreased and the collagen filaments were extended into the periphery of the cells. So correctively, does this data indicate that collagen 70A1 coordinate action and collagen filament networks and the regressive migration? So this is the summary of my talk. So we have no time, so just final slide. So this study was supported by these collaborators and grants from Japanese Society of the Professional Science and I understand something. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So thank you very much for <clears throat> uh, these two excellent uh, talks. Um, just please uh, put the questions into the chat if you have any. Um, I would have one, but but I'll start with there's uh, Vincent Flaché uh, uh, who is having a question. What is the hypothesized link between the T cells and the sebaceous gland? Um, and how are skin resident uh, T cells behaving upon uh, TSLP overexpression? So obviously this is directed to Ruth. Can you speculate on that? 
Yeah, that's a great um, question. It's exactly what we're working on right now. Um, I think based on some of the preliminary data that we have from ongoing experiments since the paper was published is that we think it's mediated um, by IL-4 or IL-13, um, possibly more IL-13 than IL-4. And how IL-13 is causing, um, how IL-13 is regulating sebaceous gland activity, we're not sure yet, but we think it might regulate either the proliferation of the sebaceous glands or it might be regulating um, the uh, androgen signaling within sebaceous glands based on like some, based on looking at other papers that people have published in some of our own preliminary data yet. But, um, you know, hope all of that's in work. And yeah, I mean, it's definitely the golden question that we're trying to understand. Maybe just to follow up on that one, you know, in, in, in if this is relevant in, in the human system as well, and let's say for AD, which is obviously linked to uh, uh, TSLP overexpression, but there it's actually linked to um, reduction of uh, sebum and dry skin. Uh, can you speculate on that? Yeah, um, we had the same question. Really great question. So it turns out that um, human TSLP is a little bit different than mouse TSLP. So humans have two isoforms of TSLP, a long form and a short form. And um, in atopic dermatitis, it's actually long form of TSLP goes up and short form goes down. And long form is thought to be more inflammatory and I, um, where our short form is expressed at homeostasis and regulates more like homeostatic um, functions of TSLP. And so what we think is that in humans, atopic dermatitis causes decreased short form TSLP. So sebum is a homeostatic thing that we have on our skin. And so we think that sebum is probably regulated by short form, whereas long form is probably, which is overexpressed in atopic dermatitis, that's more inflammatory and causes a lot of the skin barrier defects in atopic dermatitis. Um, so my hypothesis would be that in humans, short form, in atopic dermatitis in humans, short form is decreased, causing a loss in homeostatic sebum production, whereas long form is increased, causing sort of those inflammatory barrier skin defects that you see in atopic dermatitis. But it's hard to tease out in mice because mice only have one isoform of TSLP. Um, and so it's hard to tell like, you know, what's the differential functions of short form versus long form. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's a couple of questions for um, Daisuke. Um, Alex Nystrom asks, have you used non-shedding collagen 17? Pardon? Just a moment. Sorry. I cannot, I cannot hear uh, that. Have, have you used non-shedding collagen 17? Uh, not yet. Yes. No. Actually, non-shedding uh, collagen 17 expressing uh, mice accelerate on the hearing. Maybe the shedding will be important for the oh. migration. Okay. Yeah. And um, Yves Pume asks, your paper illustrates that phospho-herb B2 is also decreased with aging. How much does this contribute to the delayed migration? Thank you for leading in my paper. So actually, as, as he said, EG, uh, LB2 expression is decreased in aging. So, but it, LB2 has no uh, ligands, maybe LB2, uh, make a heterodimer with EGF receptor or LB3 and LB4. And we did not find any difference, LB3 and LB4 phosphorylation. Maybe the LB2 and EGFR heterodimer is also very important for the cell migration. But the downstream signaling, maybe the MAP kinase signaling is also common. So maybe the EGFR and LB2 signaling may be all the same downstream effective. So I think I hope it's also very important. Okay. Um, thank you. That's great. Um, pardon? Now, uh, we'll close session. I, I'm, if, I, if I might have like one minute, I'll, I'll give you one question, Ruth. Um, you know, age with age, you lose uh, sebaceous glands uh, and the skin obviously gets also drier. Do you think that that actually contributes to, to that with age you, you, you gain weight? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I'm not sure how much um, baseline homeostatic amounts of sebum secretion regulate weight at baseline. I think very high super physiological levels of TSLP can cause weight loss, but um, in terms of baseline homeostatic sebum secretion, is that enough to cause somebody to lose weight or gain weight? Um, I'm not sure. If you do kind of the math, um, 
we secrete maybe like 100 to 130 calories of sebum per day on our skin. And um, TSLP affects, at least in mice, um, TSLP receptor knockout mice, they have maybe about um, two thirds or half of the regular amount of sebum. So that's maybe only like maybe 60, you know, 40 to 60 calories a day. Is that enough to cause somebody to lose weight or gain weight? I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, it's, it's unclear like what the role of homeostatic sebum is in terms of regulating weight, whether it's enough to affect weight because you know you can eat a couple of potato chips and that makes up for the amount of sebum that you might lose via sebum. Um, but yeah, I mean, it certainly is a thought. Um, I think super physiological TSLP might be therapeutically able to control weight, but I just am not sure about how much homeostatic sebum would be able to uh, regulate weight. And, and very, very briefly on that one, a follow-up uh, from Eniko. Uh, how are TSLP levels in, in obese versus skinny patients? Do you have anything on that? Yeah, so um, we have looked through some um, like gene expression data, GWAS studies. There doesn't seem to be any association of TSLP levels in the serum of obese versus um, skinny patients. Um, I see the, the other question, do you have any evidence for this mechanism in humans? All the, the only human studies that we've done are to look at um, TSLP expression versus sebaceous gland gene expression in human skin. And we see that the higher the TSLP expression, the higher the sebaceous gland gene expression in human skin. Um, but in terms of relating that to a, a metabolic phenotype in humans, we haven't um, seen, we haven't come across anything about that. But, you know, hopefully we're gonna start some, um, clinical trials potentially um, to look at the role of therapeutic TSLP in controlling weight. And so maybe we'll have something more from that um, later on. Great, so we have a last question for Daisuke, I think. Uh, yeah, how does collagen 17 act for cell migration and rotation? Um, I thought that its function is mainly for binding of cells to the matrix. So thank you for questions. Yes, and matrix binding is one of the mechanisms of the involved in the motility. And we found that uh, decrease, uh, change the expression and, and the distribution to protein by the uh, collagen knockdowns. And we also found that remodeling of cytoskeletal network. Cytoskeleton will be very important for the motility itself. So I think collagen safety A1 demodulates the coordination of cytoskeletal network. It is also a very important mechanism for the Degrading migration and the rotation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> I think with that, um, we'll wrap up uh, this uh, kitchen uh, seminar. So first of all, thank you very much for the two speakers for these excellent talks uh, and, and congratulations to these excellent papers. Uh, so this was the freshly baked and in two weeks on the 17th, we have uh, David Adams and Neil Rajan uh, on a sweet and sour who will uh, cross their uh, blades <clears throat> on that topic about sequencing in skin tumors. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Oh, and there's on the 1st of uh, December, thanks Thomas for sharing as well, the recipe book uh, about uh, skin models with this uh, 3D epidermal uh, tissue from Ellen. And uh, thanks again, everyone for listening. Uh, thanks Edel for co-chairing as well and was a pleasure. And uh, thanks obviously also for Pfizer for the support and see you next week. Oh, in two weeks. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye everyone. <laughs>